Hi, my name is Kelly. However, my parents' pet name for me is Nietzsche. I have always loved computers. One day, my father told me a funny story about how back in the early 2000s, one of his computers came with an Einstein-like animated assistant who would pop up whenever you had a question. My father used to trick my oldest brother, Sean, who was only three at the time, that it was a real person living inside the screen. This got me thinking. Is it possible for a computer to actually become human-like? As I pondered this and other related questions, such as, can a smartphone become self-aware? I realized that I needed to know more about the history of computing and programming. I was surprised to learn that the very first digital computer was our own hands. You can count with them, remember things, and so much more. Although our hands are quite useful, they are limited. Thus, over 4,000 years ago, it appears the Sumerians developed an abacus. This is a counting device. It became popular among the Egyptians, Persians, Greeks, and Chinese. Great thinkers like Panini from India and Archimedes from Greece developed grammar and mathematical rules to better comprehend recursions, which is where a particular thing is defined in terms of itself. Historians believe that the antique Athera mechanism was the first analog computer. It was first discovered off a Greek island in the early 1900s and is believed to date back more than 2,000 years. Centuries later, Islamic astronomers further refined a fantastic tool to help in measuring celestial bodies in which, in turn, allowed sailors to better navigate when the ocean was calm. It is known as an astrolabe, which was first invented by Hipparchus around 200 BCE. However, it was not until the 19th century that Charles Babbage created what is now known today as the first modern computer, an analytic engine. Sadly, his brilliant design wasn't built during his lifetime. Working with Babbage was the remarkable Ada Lovelace, daughter of Lord Byron, the famous romantic poet, who may be rightly called the first computer programmer. Perhaps the most famous father of modern-day computing is Alan Turing, who wrote a famous paper in 1936 on computable numbers. This led to the idea of a universal machine where potentially any mathematical problem could be solved. Less well-known, but a vital link in the history of computation is mathematician engineer Claude Shannon, who is the chief architect behind information theory and digital circuit design. One of the very first all-purpose electronic computers was made in 1946 and showcased at the University of Pennsylvania. It was called ENIAC. After World War II, there have been remarkable advances in computer technology, including the invention of the microprocessor in the late 1960s, which led to the evolution of microcomputers. By the 1980s, personal computers became a viable option for consumers. They allowed individuals to do all sorts of amazing things that were not possible before, including word processing and electronic mail. However, what really transformed computers was the advent of the Internet that evolved from the United States Department of Defense's ARPANET. The Internet connects individual computing devices throughout the world electronically. It may be likened to a massive global brain that allows for super-fast communication between local and distant peoples and lands. Upon the Internet can be laid all sorts of applications, Perhaps the most significant and powerful app is the World Wide Web, which was advanced by Tim Berners-Lee while working at CERN in Switzerland in 1989, working on a Steve Jobs-inspired computer called Next. The Internet and the Web utilize hypertext, which allows one to navigate from one link to another seamlessly. Jorge Borges, the erudite writer from Argentina, is often credited with envisioning a fictional form of hypertext in a short story, The Garden of Forking Paths, as far back as 1941. Today, many people around the world have a computer, usually a smartphone that they carry around with them wherever they go. One survey estimated that teenagers check their cell phones at least 150 times a day. We've all become very attached to our computational devices. In fact, most of us won't leave home without some electronic device that is connected to the internet in the multiplicity of apps. The amount of information that we can now access is so vast that it is almost impossible to imagine. 
We don't even need to store books, films, or other data because of cloud computing. The term cloud computing describes how anyone with an internet-connected gadget can access data, text, images, or movies that is stored on massive servers positioned around the world. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft have lots of servers. With so much computing power, which appears to grow exponentially year by year, it can allow for programmers to create incredibly lifelike simulations of the real world. Gamers are acutely aware of how much more realistic their games have become since the 1980s, even on cheaper devices. Indeed, we now live at a time where it is becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish what is real and what is artificial. This illusion as reality became clearer to me when I put on the virtual reality headset Oculus Rift. Right from the beginning, even with the tutorial, I felt immersed into another world. Dinosaurs came alive and you can even walk right over and breathe onto your face. My mom got so scared of the animal, fake as it was, that she immediately took off the headset and said, wow, that is way too real. With virtual reality becoming better each year, it got me thinking about what the future of computation holds for us. Will we live in self-created worlds? Will artificial intelligence become too powerful to control? Will computers become human-like? To better answer these questions, I turn to great thinkers in science, such as Max Tegmark, Stephen Hawking, Ray Kurzweil, and Elon Musk. The first thing I focused on was Ray Kurzweil's idea about the law of accelerating returns and how it applies to the future of technology. One of the ways to envision how this law works is to imagine placing a piece of candy, let's use two M&Ms for example, and placing it on the first square of a game board that has 15 other squares. Now for each square after the first, you double the amount of M&Ms. What is astounding is how quickly the amount of M&Ms increase. At 16 squares, you have 64,536 pieces of candy. Now if you have 300 spaces and are doing the same doubling on each square, the number of M&Ms is beyond imagination. Or put another way, by the time you've reached the 300th square, you could replace every atom in the universe with a piece of M&M candy. What this means when applied to technology is obvious, since every year, if not months, digital devices get more powerful and cheaper. The smartphone in our pocket is a thousand times more capable than all the NASA computers that got the first man on the moon back in 1969. We've become addicted to an array of digital devices. Scanning information moment to moment has become our addiction. Neil Postman, the acerbic media critic, has long argued that we have been swallowed whole by technology where the newest gadget is given higher priority than real human interaction. We have become attached to the interactive display screen and less with the person across from us. Stephen Hawking, the famous Cambridge astrophysicist, is scared of the potential danger of artificial intelligence since it could become too powerful to control. As Hawking argued, it would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate, he said. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded. The fear of AI and what it might portend has become the touchstone of our age. Books and movies focusing on the consequences of runaway synthetic intelligence have become a mainstay, including Dan Brown's latest novel, Origin, where a computer scientist comes to realize that humans and machines will in just 30 years become one and the same. The question that confronts us now is this, will AI usher in a better or worse world for us? In the late 1960s, after Stanley Kubrick's movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey was released, my grandfather Warren, a highly educated lawyer well trained in mathematics and the sciences, categorically told my dad that a computer, no matter how advanced, will never beat a grandmaster in chess. Well, my grandfather was wrong. Just three decades later, an IBM computer poetically named Deep Blue beat the premier chess master in the world, Garry Kasparov. This past year, AlphaGo, a sophisticated computer program developed by Google's DeepMind, beat 18-time world champion Lee Sedol at the extraordinary complex game Go. This was an unexpected outcome since many scientists predicted it would take another 5 or 10 years for a computer to achieve such mastery. 
But the most shocking news to rock the AI community happened when it was announced that a new version of AlphaGo Zero beat its predecessor in head-to-head -head Go competition, a mind-boggling 100 to 0. The implications of this development cannot be understated since the law of accelerating returns allows synthetic intelligence to grow at an exponential rate. Given what AlphaGo has been able to accomplish in such a short period of time, it gives one pause since we may be on the threshold of advancing algorithms that are far beyond our ability to either understand or control them. As David Meyer for Fortune Magazine opined, while it sounds like some sort of soda, AlphaGo Zero may represent as much of a breakthrough as its predecessor, since it could presage the development of algorithms with skills that humans do not have. Those very last eight words, algorithms with skills that humans do not have, should give us a deep pause, if not a ponderous shudder. As Nick Bostrom would say, far from being the smartest possible biological species, we are probably better thought of as the stupidest possible biological species capable of starting a technological civilization. Today, we interact with voice-activated devices such as Amazon's Echo and Apple's iPhone. We even give the intelligent assistants personal names, such as Alexa or Siri. What will happen when these programs become so lifelike that they know us more intimately than any of our family or friends? What happens in some when we cannot tell the difference between a human being and an AI? The relationship we have with technology is becoming ever more intimate, such that we spend more time with computers than with humans. Our computers are becoming us, and in the world of tomorrow, we may have difficulty knowing whether we are speaking with a humanoid or an android. Alan Turing, back in 1950, proposed a test that became well known as the imitation game. Simply put, by only using a series of written exchanges, one attempts to determine whether the person hiding behind a screen is a human being or merely a machine. If computers in the future will easily trick us into believing that they are like us, does it mean that they too have self-awareness? Do they too also possess consciousness? The answer to those questions appears to be directly connected to how our own brains produce subjective awareness. If we could properly understand how a complex net of 86 billion neurons within our craniums creates consciousness, then we would have a potential model for reconstructing something similar in a machine. If consciousness can be mathematically explained in terms of a complex informational system, then it is substrate independent. This means that self-awareness is not dependent on any particular biological material, but can be reconstructed using artificial chips. The implications for this, if true, are profound, since in the future we can endow almost anything with subjective awareness. We are at a crossroad in human existence, since we are giving birth to a new species of artificially intelligent machines that may wholly transcend our ability to control or understand them. Yet it may be that such doomsday prophecies are mistaken, and that in the future we will evolve symbiotically in mutually beneficial ways with technology. It is fascinating to reflect that the very first computer prototype was our own hands, and from those fingers and our enlarged brain, we have created a digital future that is beyond our wildest imaginations. The deeper issue that confronts us now is this. Will the world of tomorrow be a utopian like paradise where technology benefits humankind, or will AI turn out to be a nightmare from which we cannot awake?